Hi, my name is Amjad Khan. I'm in year 13 and I'm the senior prefect for diversity. This year, the theme for Black History Month is ancestors and descendants. We are looking to the past to learn through our connected histories and explore the impact of our ancestors on who we are today and what it means to be British. We are encouraging everyone to get involved, to learn about our ancestors, both personal and in the wider context. Share your ideas and knowledge, try something new. There will be talks, events and workshops, both in and out of lessons, to perhaps try something different or even learn something new. We wrote manifestos for our Ducks Leadership Committees. I'm going to use my leadership role to make sure that every voice is heard. Ducks is inclusive and that's the way we like it. You two are learning from the amazing leaders that came before us. Maybe one day I win awards just like Girls of Parks and Nelson Mandela because I will continue to campaign for everyone that needs our support and help. When we're thinking and looking back on our ancestors, trying to learn and understand them, it's important to learn from their mistakes and celebrate their achievements. So if we don't learn from their mistakes, who knows what would happen? We're very lucky that people in the past have made technology that has made the future a much better and easier place. Throughout the last two years, We've seen this in action and seen how important it is to communicate through technology and come together as a community and connect with each other. We can't control the past. Many of us are descendants of people who have done horrible things or had horrible things done to them. We can't change that. But what we can change is the future. So it's all of our responsibilities to learn about the past so that we can better understand the present and better shape our futures. I think it's so crucial to look into our past, to see where we've come from, who we've come from, where we've come from. I think these things create us, they create the people around us, and they create the community that we live in today and the community we will live in tomorrow. Um, I think we've got to recognise that we've all come from the same place. We've all got the same descendants, if we trace back, what, 200,000 years ago? Imagine we're, we're all from the same place. And there should be no me, and there should be no you, and us, and them. We should, we should recognise the community we live in. Of course there's an element of individuality that we need to recognise within ourselves. But skin colour, your ethnicity, these things shouldn't be something that we look at and go, ah, oh, that's, that's about them, that's the only thing we recognise about a person. We should of course acknowledge that. And we've seen what, we've seen the treatment of people in the past, the, the treatment that often is unspoken because it's something that's so difficult to talk about today. But the past is something we can't change. But the past is something we can really learn from. And all we can do is acknowledge that past. So I think history as a discipline can offer a great deal to the cultural and the political and the commemorative projects that are bound up with Black History Month, in part by asking two very important questions. And one of those is, what do we know? And the other is, how do we know it? And that's the question that we're here to discuss today about this year's theme for Black History Month, which is ancestry and descent. And uh, you guys have got quite interesting stories that you're uh, happy enough to, to share. And so we're just going to go around the room and, and hear some of those about what you know and how you know it. Um, so on my father's side, I have quite a fragmented um, narrative of how he came to Britain. Um, so he was born in 1965 in the middle of the Vietnam War and having lost um, his mother there and his connection there. He was adopted and came with his adopted family across to the UK, a journey that took him through most of mainland Asia, across Europe, and then finally to Britain. Whereas um, my mother's story is a bit more 
um, well developed, mostly because that happened for her 20 years later um, at the turn of the century. So she made the journey herself across from um, China, um, which, you know, um, it took her quite a while to sort of come through um, to talk to me about the struggles with um, immigration laws. And that was something that um, made me realize a lot about this, the struggles of displacement and conflict and how sort of that impacted my lineage throughout the years, how I came to be about 6,000 miles away from where my parents came from. So much of what I know is from a sort of oral tradition throughout my family. We sort of see it as a rite of passage to know and understand sort of where we came from and how we got to where we are. Um, though now that I've become more aware of the political socio social circumstances around my parents coming here, I've been able to sort of glance over the legal documents that my mum had to sort of push through to sort of have her right to be in this country. Um, so I think whilst those documents have sort of imprinted on my mind, the oral narrative that I've been sort of taught is something that I find more personal and stays with me more than anything uh, that I could keep as a physical copy, something that I only know in my mind or my heart that I can understand about where I came from. Quite similar to Jamie's, um, there isn't really, I mean there are documents definitely, but in terms of how we learn stories and how we learn traditions, it's oral tradition. Um, so my grandfather passed it down to my father and my father's passed it down to me and um, my siblings. There has to be an element of trust between the, t the storyteller and the story receiver. Um, and if I'm being told a story, then I believe it's my duty to make sure I'm aware of the certain things I'm being told and the specifics and to, to the people who I'm going to resend that info to. I want to make sure I'm, say I'm saying the right things and in the same way my father tells me or my mother tells me. My great-grandfather moved from India to Malawi where he essentially started a business and as, as he gained more money he allowed his family from who were still in Gujarat to gradually build up money to be able to move to Mal Malawi as a whole. But as, the, as the time wore on, um, a president called Kamuzu Banda got into power um, and he was a big nationalist. Um, and he wasn't happy with the splitting of the classes between the whites as the upper class, the Indians as the middle class, and the black people as the lower class. And he wanted to restore that. Um, and due to that, he essentially um, told the Indian people that their businesses are going to be forfeited to the black people um, if they weren't going to leave to Britain, which had arisen as an opportunity as it was a British colony. So that essentially forced my um, family to move from a lot from Malawi to Britain. Um, when they first arrived, due to like the heavy racism that was prevalent within the country, they found it a bit um, uncomfortable to adjust to. But obviously, as time got on, um, they became more comfortable, partly due to the, the success that um, the business they started up um, uh, kind of built over time. So yeah, as that developed um, and as the business developed, their enjoyment in Britain um, increased. And as more and as more family became, and obviously um, as families got larger with children, um, and as more Indian people came into um, Britain, the time their time here definitely got better. And my dad said at first it was a hard decision and it was very hard for them, um, but in hindsight it was definitely the best decision they ever made. So I'd say that the the richer part of my family history lies on my dad's side, and. Um, I guess the stories that he, that he's told me um, have kind of been passed down, you know. I guess um, in a in a long uh, oral tradition since about um, the later nineteenth century, and um, the stories. The, I guess the most interesting story that he's told me, and perhaps the most important, is that of his great great grandfather, um, a figure who reportedly was over six feet tall, had six had six toes, and um, fought and killed uh, a lion. And um, I guess the official, the official family line is that um, this figure, my dad's great-great-great-grandfather, 
um, rebelled and won and um, overthrew uh, a king in southeastern Nigeria by the name of Judge of Opobo, who was a slave, formerly a slave, and then became a slave owner once he emancipated himself. Um, but I guess I was a bit, uh, I, I kind of wanted to hold this story in scrutiny. And um, so what I did, I, I went to Wikipedia and found that uh, this guy, Judge of Opobo, was, he was indeed a slave and he did emancipate himself. And um, he, quite interestingly, he, um, he took over the production of um, palm oil in southeastern Nigeria and restricted, um, restricted access to palm oil and, and to the industry um, for, British, uh, for British merchants. Um, so cutting off, British, cutting, off, cutting off the British from, um, from this trade in this industry. And um, obviously this upset, um, I guess this upset the British imperial powers and they recruited my great, great, great grandfather to um, overthrow this guy and reestablish um, British hegemony. So in a sense, you could say that um, our family were instrumentalized by the British to, um, you know, to, I guess, oversee or to um, establish their interests. And um, I just, I find it interesting the way that um, the story has kind of been repurposed to paint this narrative of, of our family as being, you know, um, as rebelling against, or yeah, uh, I guess, fighting this noble cause and rebelling against um, this figure, this figure, Judge of Apobo, when in reality, the story was much more complex than that. This particular story, uh, I, I, I like the very uncanny nature of it. I, I guess the, the uncanny nature of, of our of, um, family progression, where you have, you know, in the 1890s, this, I guess, puppet of British imperialism with six toes over six feet, this wrestle the tiger or lion rather. And then you get to me, in you know the modern day, like the the difference, but the difference between them is so uncanny, but yet they're connected. And I think it's that kind of interconnectivity, but the, also like the uncanny nature on the surface, that's that's weird, and you can't you can't exactly imagine how the two things are connected. But then you, I guess, you look you know beneath the surface and you find the connection. And Andre, in the case of your family history, there's a very circuitous route that that takes us halfway around the world. Yeah, I mean, one one of the things that I've found most captivating about my family history is that in a sense, it's kind of been pushed along and um, forced through by um, external um, events. And I think that that is embodied in my grandma who um, was born in Berlin um, and she was Jewish, um, her well, she was Jewish on her mother's side. Her father had fought in World War I, um, and he had, I believe, divorced her mother because of religious tension. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the outbreak of World War II, um, or just before, rather, um, her mother and brother were moved to the UK um, on a resettlement program, but she was deemed unable to support herself and therefore not um, eligible to um, travel to the UK. So her father um, christened her in, in an attempt to hide her Jewish identity and she went to live with her grandmother um, on her father's side in East Prussia in um, Koningsberg, which is now um, Kaliningrad. And she lived in her basement throughout the war. She was too afraid to take her out and take her to school. Um, so she essentially lived in the basement throughout throughout the war. Um, and then with the advancement of the Soviet Union from the East um, and all the stories of kind of horror and rape and pillage, um, they decided to flee westward. Um, and they trekked across um, a modern day Poland um, with the intended uh, destination being Dresden um and having walked all this distance just as um dresden was in the distance um the carpet bombing um began and my grandma was so young um that i think she was about 12 that she thought that it was fireworks wow. um and shortly after that my well her grandma 
um, died of starvation, having given her all the food. Um, and by some miracle, she was picked up by the Red Cross and moved to the um, to the UK, um, having arrived there at the age of 14, um, completely illiterate, um, barely any education. She then somehow managed to um, get into King's College, um, London, um, I believe on a history or English degree, um, undergraduate. And then having gone on to study a PhD at the Royal Institute of Education, she met my grandfather um, who had lived in um, Tehran in poverty. I uncovered them when I was preparing a eulogy for my, for my grandma. Um, and that, in a sense, very much propelled my love of history. I think that it gave me a real sense of identity and also kind of uncovered this huge story that I'd only known very, very little about, which in many ways opened my eyes, I, I, I guess, to the kind of joy um, of uncovering such w within, within history. As a subject. Yeah. One of the things that I think struck me listening to these four stories is the importance of asking questions and having the courage perhaps to ask questions of our families, um, questions which we may think we feel uncomfortable doing but which often I found in hindsight people wanted to talk about, they wanted to tell you who they are and where they've come from and the degree to which I think that informs us and who we are. One of my favourite lines from a poem opens with um, time past and time present are perhaps both present in time future. I think reckoning with the past and knowing the struggles um, of what went into that and what my family did to move on with it sort of fills me with hope um, and motivation to know that sort of change and movement has always been a part of my family history and that perhaps it will motivate me in the future to deal with what comes next. Thank you to all of those that shared their stories and the importance of their ancestry to their own identity and also to the importance of celebrating black history not just in this designated month of October but always. Black History Month originated in America and has been celebrated in Britain more widely since 1987. The focus and the spotlight is on the contributions of black people to Britain's economy, culture and society, and therefore the contribution that has been made to all of history. This is our collective history and we have a wonderful opportunity to now fill in the gaps that have been eradicated, hidden or forgotten. So get curious, do some discovery, learn something, ask questions, and in doing so you will find things to both celebrate, but possibly also things to reconcile. History can sometimes be a messy, challenging, uncomfortable thing to have to confront, but it is vital and it is necessary, and it is our job to do so. There is so much happening around the college over the next few weeks, so look forward to all that you will learn in your lessons and also in your societies. There will be important figures that you may not know now, but who you will come to know. Fill in the gaps, have a look at our programme of events and get involved, and through that you will be contributing to the work to make our history more inclusive and more complete. And now it's time to share your stories. What is the earliest event that you can remember in your life? How far can you trace back your family line? What from the past has shaped who you are, the descendants of ancestors that have come before you? I learnt a huge amount from my granddad, who loved to tell stories of the country of his birth, Guyana. He, along with my grandmother and my aunt and my dad, who was at the time a teenager, came across to Britain in 1962, just under a decade after the Windrush brought many people from the Caribbean to the UK. My granddad's stories of Guyana made me feel connected to a time and a place that I wasn't familiar with. 
I was born just down the road in Clapham. But actually my grandparents really helped me to understand a different time and a different place which contributed hugely to who I was and my own story. The first school that I taught in almost 20 years ago happened to be on the very same road that was the first road that they settled on when they first came to London in 1962. That wonderful magic of the continuity of time and history. So share your own stories of ancestors and descendants with one another now as we mark the start of Dulwich College's Black History Month. And if you don't know who Equiano is, then there is your first challenge for the month. Find out who he was and the amazing contribution that he made to Britain. I will end on his words. After all, what makes any event important unless by its observation we become better and wiser and learn. <laughs>